coming to my talk. My name is Corey Eddy. I am a fish biologist for Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Lower Great Lakes. Tonight, this morning, this afternoon, whatever it is, I'm going to talk to you about a cost-effective alternative to recovering lost deep water acoustic receivers. That is a very antiseptic title for what I hope is a much more light-hearted speech. So, uh, be prepared for a lot of pictures, a video, and maybe a uh, rock opera, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, diving right in, most people are probably familiar with what an ROV is, so I'll be very brief with my introduction. ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. The picture you see right up there is the very first ROV ever built. That's the Prudel. It was built by Dmitry Rebikov in 1953 to find deep water wrecks that were beyond scuba depths. Um, as we know, ROVs are often used for exploration, for search and rescue and search and recovery missions, for surveys, for inspections of boats, docks, marinas, what have you. Also for taking photos and videos. Stay tuned for next year's Christmas card. Uh, as well as specimen collection, capture, and even culling. You might be more familiar with this one. This is the Argo that was created by Bal Ballard out of Woods Hole. This was the ROV that found the Titanic. This is my personal favorite. Some friends of mine built this. It's called the Resweeper. It's actually designed to capture a base of lionfish with a pneumatic spear. And I should actually say this is my favorite. This is our ROV. Um, this is a blue ROV made by Blue Robotics. It's uh, an open source, very cheap, very affordable ROV. And you'll see a lot of pictures coming up. So briefly, how does our ROV work? It's very straightforward. I don't want to say simple because it can be complicated, but it's very straightforward. We have your very traditional game controller that's connected to our laptop, which is connected to a magic box, which is then connected to the ROV. We have a program called Ground Control, which is actually in the laptop, but for the purpose of this talk, it makes a little more sense if I put it on the magic box, we'll understand in a second. So that is connected to a, in our case, 100 meter surface tether, which allows us to, com to communicate with the ROV. And that ROV has eight thrusters for vertical movement, horizontal movement, it's, you, can, you can incline it, you can tilt it, you can actually make it roll like a, like a jet fighter. It has a camera with headlights, it has a compass, and it has both depth and speed gauges. Now we don't have the option, but you can attach a fiber optic cable to it to provide very accurate GPS location of your ROV when it's out doing whatever you've got it doing. So it's again very straightforward. You put all that on the boat, you go out to your spot, you throw it overboard, and you do your thing. But going back to ground control, when we were coming up with an idea of what to name this thing, ground control immediately makes us think of Space Oddity by David Bowie. And we had a lot of fun sort of picturing this <laughs> <laughs> straight from the original 19 whatever video. And with Space Oddity in mind and David Bowie in mind, we thought at very first, and maybe we would call it ROV Major Tom, because it just works. But then we are freshwater biologists and we are not rock stars. So we thought instead it makes more sense to call it the ROV Major Mad Tom because again we're biologists and that's a Mad Tom. <laughs> and that's what we stuck with and we're pretty fond of it. We think we're all very clever. <laughs> so here again is a picture. This was taken at the YMCA on our first test drive. We have a 7000 approximately $7,000 price tag on it, so it's very affordable, especially when you think about how much money you're saving in the long run. Highlighted in that circle, the ROV comes with a little claw that can be used for picking things up. We hoped to use it to attach clips to our lost receivers in order to recover them. We found out pretty quickly that it doesn't hold the clip very well. So we made just a very easy modification. We built what you, what's called a quick clip. If there's any rock climbers here, you know that this is how you put your belay rope right onto the rocks, right onto the clips. And it works very well. We put a carabiner in it. We attach that to the ROV. The carabiner has a rope attached to the boat. And with that, we can go up and attach to our receivers. This is a process of trial and error. We put the ROV in the water at the local Y, we sped it around, we did some laps and some spins, we tried to attach it to mock receivers underwater. We learned 
pretty quickly how to operate it, how to approach the receivers, and then we took those lessons and we brought them to the lake again and just kept at it. And it was a steep learning curve. I am not the pilot. Kyle Morgan is our primary pilot. He's actually should be giving this speech, but he couldn't make it, so I'm giving it for him. Um, we've had, as I mentioned, a few problems. We found, for example, there was a pressure issue, and the pressure was dropping, which means you could get water in, and this is just a picture of us spraying a little soap on it to find out where the leak was. So there weren't any catastrophic problems, but there's little bits and pieces that pop up that we have to attend to. But otherwise, it's just gone very smoothly through trial and error. Again, it's, it's uh, not that expensive for what we're doing. That's ROVs in a nutshell, and that is our ROV in a nutshell. I don't want to talk too much about acoustic telemetry because we've just had three great talks that introduced it. So in a nutshell, as you've heard, the transmitter goes inside the fish, the fish then sends out a signal, and our receivers listen for that signal and record it. So we are from the Lower Great Lakes office. We work very closely with the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation Network, GLaDOS, and through GLaDOS at this point, um, the most recent time we looked, there are more than 2,300 acoustic receivers scattered throughout the Great Lakes. Lake Ontario has about 500, Lake Erie has about 500, so as you've heard and as you probably understand, it's an incredibly powerful technology for listening to fish and seeing where they go. But of course, we don't always get them back and I will get to that first. A little bit more about how we deploy it. So our team actually uses 60 pound um, cement blocks and we have our very specific GPS coordinates because I, I need to emphasize how important it is to have very specific GPS coordinates for the search and recovery and that will make sense in a minute. So we go to our site, we throw the block overboard it's attached, or the, rather the receiver is attached to it, sometimes two or more receivers. And otherwise, as you've also heard, there are um, acoustic releases, which are the bottom picture. And oftentimes we have our cement block in one location, and then we have another cement anchor maybe 100 meters or up to 300 meters away attached with a steel cable or a rope. And that is the first way that we try to recover these. We throw a grapple overboard like Batman, we drag it between the primary receiver, excuse me, the primary block and the anchor block, and we try to grapple it up. It works pretty often, but obviously not always. And the bottom picture being the acoustic releases. This is the medical release that was just talked about. There are other third-party releases that are less reliable, but sometimes when you show up in the boat and you send that signal down, for one reason or another, it just doesn't respond. We found this summer a lot of problems with batteries. We had a lot of batteries die, so we had lost receivers. And you can imagine when they're about $5,000 a pop, and our team has about 100 that we're responsible for, it can add up that price tag. So when we have missing equipment, our first objective is to send the divers into the water. And this receiver here was found right outside the mouth of the Genesee River, almost completely buried in sediment from the river. So you can imagine just by that picture how hard it would be to grapple that chain up because it's buried in about two feet. So that was a pretty remarkable find because it was really just the top two inches sticking out. If the divers can't recover it, or primarily when it's too deep for divers because we're restricted to 100 feet, that's when we send in the ROV. So here's a couple pictures. The top right was one we actually did manage to grapple, but then we pulled it under a boulder and it got stuck. <laughs> the bottom picture is just the receiver that we couldn't hit with the grapple at all, so we sent down the ROV. Now I want to walk through our diving methods. Again, that GPS coordinate is very, very important to this process. We know, generally speaking, where that receiver should be. So when we're going to send the ROV after it, we hover on top of those exact coordinates. We throw a descent line down with just a 15-pound anchor. And you can see in this picture, it's attached to the buoys up top. We send the ROV down that anchor line, which again, assuming it's almost the exact spot. And briefly, if anybody was wondering about my color scheme, it exactly matches the color of Lake Ontario. <laughs> so we, we drop down that line, we get to the bottom, the anchor is just off to the left. We do a quick 360 scan in case we're sitting on top of it and it's nearby. 
at the same time as we've descended, we have a general idea of whether we're east, north, south, or west of it. So our first stop is we look at the compass, and if we think we're south, we'll go north. And we'll just go a little bit further. Looking for it, we'll go back to that anchor line. We'll do a, a star pattern back and forth until we eventually find it. We clip on, we surface, we celebrate, high fives. Um, this is us searching. This is us where you can almost see, barely see the uh, orange float spheres in the distance. I'm going to send you, I'm going to show you a video of the whole thing. It's a bit long, so I'm just going to talk. Whoops. You can almost hear the song. It's not really <laughs> um, But that's better. I should tell stories because, again, this is trial and error, and we have had a few issues. This, um, this block right here, I'm pretty sure this is our deepest at 80 meters, so almost 300 feet we were able to recover this. But at the time, we had the rope attached to the ROV in the bag. And in this situation, that rope wouldn't come out of the bag. So we had the ROV attached to the rope stuck on this, and then the battery died. And we had no way to know if we could actually pull it loose. ROV off, option, here we go, we've got the clip, and we're free, and we go. So it's really that easy. Well, maybe it's not that easy. <laughs> a and B, with a little bit of effort, a pretty smooth process. So let me finish that story. We, we were basically tied onto the block, the battery died, and we had no choice but to pull on that tether cord, which is a very last case scenario because it's, it is clipped on, so it's kind of rugged, but at the same time, if that comes out, then your machine is gone. So we were lucky um, to pull that one up. It was filthy, it was black with anoxic muck, but it was our best, so we were very pleased. So briefly, some advantages and disadvantages. Um, starting with the pros, this ROV, ROV can go deeper and longer than Fish and Wildlife Service divers are allowed. We are limited to 100 feet at the very most, although we're going to try to change that a little bit. And at 100 feet, we have approximately 20 minutes, so the ROV can go much longer and much deeper than that. It also requires a smaller team. When we're in the water, we need a captain, we need a boat tender, we need two divers at least. The ROV takes a much smaller team than that. It is eventually going to be less expensive when you consider the price tag, the money you're saving versus our salaries. And it's obviously safer because you don't have people in the water. The cons are that it does require some assembly. This thing came in about 10 boxes, and each box had 10 other little boxes in it, and it was a Lego extravaganza. So it's technically challenging to build, technically challenging to operate, and it does take a lot of trial and error. But again, the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Our ROV can go down to 300 meters. There's another version that's limited to 100 meters. And if I say there's no limit, it's not exactly true because it is limited by battery power. And in the right conditions, that can go for several operations before it dies. Um, and I did, of course, mention some assembly. This is all the pieces that came in when Kyle sort of took it upon himself. He asked for help in the whole team turned on our heels and said, man, this is up to you, best man. <laughs> and he's done a fantastic job. So again, just wrapping up with a brief discussion. So far, we have covered all seven of the receivers we went for. Um, when you take that price tag off the top, we saved over $25,000 in the first year. And we will be in, that, in the water every year doing the same thing. Again, the max depth was almost 300 feet, which is pretty remarkable. In the future, we hope to, to continue using this ROV for fish and habitat surveys. Uh, we also have the opportunity to use it sort of as a diver assistant, so we can have the ROV filming the divers, and it, and it provides a direct line of communication, so if there's a problem with the dive, the captain knows immediately, and if we needed to send a note up to the surface, we can actually write on our slate and flash it to the ROV, and the captain will say, okay, send in another diver with a tank or with a tool. So there's a lot of options, a lot of opportunities with this thing. I want to again acknowledge Kyle for building it, for remnanting it, for taking the whole thing on himself. And I want to thank my team for all their support throughout the ROV process. Uh, that's Joe Johnson. She will be talking tomorrow at probably 11, maybe 9, we're not really sure. <laughs> uh, the historical Lake Sturgeon data in the Upper Niagara. Greg Cronish talking tomorrow at 9.20, talking about categorizing behaviors of Lake Sturgeon in the, in the Niagara. 
and Alex Gatch. Last but absolutely not least, he's got a great talk about seasonal habitat use and the site fidelity of Cisco and Lake Ontario tomorrow to wrap up the conference. And we'll acknowledge our supervisor, Dimitri Dorsey, he's not presenting, but if you've been around the New York chapter, you know who he is. He is here, he is there. If you haven't met him yet, you will because he's everywhere and he's waving. And I want to thank Fish and Wildlife for giving me a job, the New York chapter of AFS for having us, Stony Brook for hosting us, and Great Lakes Restoration Initiative for providing all the money. If you have any questions, I'm happy to <laughs>